Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. When a player criticizes a coach publicly and puts everyone on blast, and the coach eventually gets wind of what was said, the player in question can do one of three things. Option one is to double down on the statement and say that he meant every word of what he said. In other words, a wide receiver is upset that the game plan involves him not getting the ball as much as he'd like. He makes those comments and then doubles down, saying that he stands by what he said and that for the team to be successful, he needs to get the ball. Option two is to pretend like the issue is resolved entirely and that you're ready to move on. Let's say a cornerback is publicly criticizing the amount of zone coverage the team plays because he wants to play more man-to-man. -man. A day after making those comments, he might say, Coach and I talked and hashed out our differences, and it's in the past, and we're ready to move forward and focus on getting ready for next week. But then, there is option three, or what I'm calling the hilariously cowardly option. It's the option equivalent to you'd say it online, but if you saw the person face-to-face, you wouldn't dare repeat those words. Because option three is to essentially say, after being threatened by your coach, I was wrong. I didn't mean any word of those comments. Did I criticize your coaching? Because I didn't mean to do that at all. Well, in 1990, we had this hilarious moment involving Pittsburgh Steelers head coach Chuck Knoll and starting quarterback Bubby Brister. The short version of it is that Brister criticized Knoll, Knoll threatened to bench Brister, and Brister took back everything he said almost immediately. The long version, however, is much funnier and crazier than that. This is the story behind the funniest retraction in the history of the Pittsburgh Steelers franchise. Before I talk about the retracted comments in question and the press conference that was a disaster in every sense of the word, we need some context to understand how the Steelers and Brister were playing that led Brister to get to this boiling point where he lashed out at his coaching staff and left no stones unturned however temporary they were. It's September 9th, 1990, and it's opening day of a brand new season. And to kick off the new year in this new decade, we've got an AFC Central matchup on our hands between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cleveland Browns, two teams that made the playoffs the year before in 1989 before falling at the hands of the Denver Broncos, with the Steelers losing on some incredibly controversial calls. You can learn more about the officiating disaster that ended Pittsburgh's previous season by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Aside from the fact that this was a big game for the obvious reasons, being that it was opening day, being that you never want to be below 500, and being that this was a rivalry game that could play a big part in tiebreakers down the road, this was a prove-it game for Pittsburgh. The last thing they wanted was a repeat of what happened in 1989 on opening day when they played the Browns, in what might be the worst opening day performance in NFL history. Pittsburgh lost that game 51-0. They turned it over eight times and picked up five first downs and 53 yards of total offense. To say that Pittsburgh wanted to get off on the right foot, and on a much better foot than whatever the heck they started off on last year, would be the understatement of the century. And the good news for the Steelers was that defensively, they played lights out. Cleveland only scored six points on offense, scoring two field goals, and one of those field goals came with an incredibly short field where the Browns didn't move the ball at all. Yes, the Browns scored a touchdown, but that came off of a 30-yard fumble return by Anthony Blaylock, so that was when the offense was on the field. Pittsburgh did what they had to do on the defensive side of the ball. The Browns had 11 first downs, they had just 158 yards of total offense, they averaged barely over 3 yards per carry, they had no plays go for more than 20 yards, and they got sacked 7 times while completing just 43% of their passes. If Pittsburgh was going to lose this game, in no way whatsoever could you pin it on the defense, as this was a vintage Steelers performance on that side of the ball. But that brings us to the bad news. And that was the fact that offensively, well, the Steelers did not play lights out. This was the first game with new offensive coordinator Joe Walden calling the plays, as the former head coach of the New York Jets took over for Tom Moore, who was the offensive coordinator in 1989, but was now a member of the Minnesota Vikings as their assistant head coach. As a side note, to learn more about the coaching career of new Steelers offensive coordinator Joe Walden, click the card in the upper right corner. And as far as first impressions go, this one was not very good. Not at all. The Steelers lost the game 13-3, and there were quite a few reasons for their anemic performance, including a slow start where they got just one first down in the first quarter, a rushing attack that was poor to the point where they only had 49 yards on 26 carries, averaging a mere 1.9 yards per carry, 
and an undisciplined and sloppy performance where they committed nine penalties. But when the offense struggles, it always comes back to one man in particular, and that man is the quarterback. For this game, Bobby Brister was getting the start under center after starting 14 games in 1989 and being not very good, as he threw nine touchdowns and ten interceptions while getting sacked 45 times, meaning that he was sacked on a whopping 11.6% of all passing attempts. It was not a good 1989 season for Brister, as the team made the playoffs in spite of him and not because of him, as he failed to throw a touchdown pass in six of his final seven starts while completing less than 49% of his passes in that stretch. And unfortunately for the Steelers, in this game, Brister was picking up right where he left off, because he was atrocious here. He was sacked three times, and was hit about a dozen others, as the man took an absolute beating back there. He went 17 for 32 with 193 yards passing, although a lot of those yards came late in the fourth quarter when the Browns were playing a prevent defense holding onto a 10-point lead late, and not wanting to allow the big play. He threw no touchdowns, and threw two interceptions in the second half, although that number easily could have been three or four, as the Browns dropped quite a few opportunities. When all was said and done, Brister and the Steelers had just 161 net yards passing, and Brister posted a passer rating of 45.4. Again, there were many reasons why the Steelers lost this one, but Brister might have been the main reason if you asked analysts and Steelers fans who watched this atrocious game of football. Facing the music and answering questions after such a performance is never easy, and is never fun, but as a starting quarterback, it's something that you've got to do. And Brister decided to take an incredibly bold, and depending on who you ask, an incredibly stupid approach to this press conference. Don't blame me for the loss. Blame our completely inept coaching staff. Brister focused on two main things in his press conference. Number one, he was not the problem. Number two, the system and the game plan were completely wrong and were completely broken. Brister said on his performance, after a game where he threw no touchdowns and two interceptions, I guess I played all right. I like to do a lot of things but I'm not the coach. A quarterback could throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns in a losing effort, and more often than not, they're going to say that they could have done more to help the team win. And here's Brister, having the audacity to say after a game where his team put up three points that he played all right. If that is all right, then a one-touchdown game is one of the greatest games in NFL history. A two-touchdown game automatically gets you inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and a three-touchdown game gets your number retired by the team and gets a statue in your honor built outside the stadium. Because in Brister's eyes, what Joe Walton and Chuck Knoll were doing was absolutely horrible. He said that by playing in this offense, he was about to come unglued, and completely rip the system to shreds. He also questioned the team's rotation at running back between Warren Williams and Tim Worley, particularly on a play by the goal line where Worley was taken out for Williams, and Williams lost yardage, saying, It's wild, ain't it? We came so far. And now, we're so far back. There's no reason why we shouldn't get the ball to Lips, and Hill, and Malarkey, and Worley, and Hodge all the time. They're our five best players. Translation, no offense, Warren Williams, but you suck, and you have no business playing, let alone getting the ball on the goal line. He hated the fact that the team rotated players, and even advocated for the team to go back to the old offense that they used to have. Basically, Brister was leading a mutiny against the coaching staff after one game criticizing everything that they did, and saying that they were the problem. Now you can imagine how well Chuck Knoll took those comments, because Knoll heard what Brister said, and Knoll responded by making it extremely clear who was running the ship. Knoll spoke a lot at his press conference the next day on the Monday after the game, but his conference could be summed up with one central theme. If Bobby Brister utters another word about the way we do things, he's gone, and he's not going to play. Noel could have said during this press conference that he was going to talk with Brister about his concerns with the offense, but that he had confidence in Joe Walden. He did not do that, because he spent the entire press conference just ripping on everything his starting quarterback said, breaking down every quote line by line. Noel said that he wasn't sure who was going to start the Week 2 game between the Steelers and the Oilers in a rematch of the 1989 wildcard game, and said that backup quarterback Rick Strom not only possibly could start, but he had a better grasp of the offense at this point, than Brister did. Noel then continued this public shaming of his quarterback, saying, our quarterback has to get himself straightened out. Pointing the finger someplace else is not going to get it done. Talking about it isn't going to get anything done. Talking about it gives you guys great stories, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help you win. If he's unglued, 
He's not going to be able to run the offense. He's in trouble. If he doesn't believe in our system, he's never going to get it done. And we'll find someone who does. Noel then doubled down on the last part, saying, We're in no position to change what we're doing. We're going to find people who believe in what we're doing and who will get it done. That's what it comes down to. I will say that it's a bit of a weird coaching strategy to create a system that doesn't suit the players and their strengths and weaknesses, and to try and fit all these square pegs into round holes. But that's beside the point. And after continuing to bash Brister in the next day presser, Knowles said that Brister had plenty of time to throw to open receivers during the game, and he just didn't hit them. Noel put his starting quarterback on blast. You are the problem. Shut up and do your job, or you're not playing. Heck, you might not even play next week because your comments and your attitude disgusted me that much. At this point, Brister had a few options at his disposal to keep his starting job. He could have come back the next day to talk about those comments and his coach's response, and said, Coach Noel and I hashed out things, and everything's good. We both know where we stand, and I understand where he was coming from, and we're ready to put this behind us and focus on playing the Houston Oilers. He could have made an apology saying that he shouldn't have gone public, because it's not fair to his teammates or the coaching staff, and that this issue was one that should have stayed behind closed doors so as not to become a distraction. But Brister chose an absolutely hilarious option. Everything I said in incredible detail? That giant tirade I went on against my coach in the system? Yeah, I didn't mean a word of it. Noel was right with everything he said, and I'm an idiot who has no idea what I'm talking about. Because Bubby Brister decided to pick the super retraction option, where he not only apologized, but said that everything that he said was wrong. As Brister said, I watched the film, I didn't play very well, and I've got to get better. And for the most part, what Noel said is true. I'll take the blame for the game. I don't think I can play any worse. That's a far cry from what he said about playing alright, and how Noel was screwing up the offense. He then added on Noel, everything he said was true. There's a lot of room for improvement. We're frustrated but we should have played better. I've got a lot of room for improvement myself. Now look, I'm not one to ever criticize a guy for apologizing and realizing the error of his ways. Apologizing when you make a mistake and say something you probably shouldn't have said, especially publicly into the press, is a good thing and shows humility. But come on! This wasn't a one-sentence heat-of-the-moment kind of comment. This was an extremely detailed description after you had a cooling-off period of how the coaching staff was failing you where you spoke at length and gave specific suggestions as to what the team could do differently. And for the record, there were quite a few columnists who, after watching Week 1 and watching the offense flounder during the preseason under Wollin's system, were completely on Brister's side. And after Noel fires back and basically threatens your employment, you do a complete 180 and say, My suggestions were stupid. My bad. From I played alright, to I don't think I can play any worse. From, we shouldn't be rotating players, to, we should be rotating players, because everything Noel said was true. You know why Brister issued this retraction. He didn't truly believe what he was saying. He was just scared of his own coach retaliating. Brister kept his starting job after these comments, and started all 16 games during the 1990 season. And even though the Steelers missed the playoffs after finishing 9-7, and, and even though it took a lot of time to get going, as Brister didn't throw any touchdowns and six interceptions over the first four games of the season, eventually, he found his rhythm in the offense and had what was undoubtedly his best year as a pro. Over the final 12 games of the season, Brister threw 20 touchdowns and just eight interceptions, with a great touchdown-to-interception ratio in that stretch of 2.5 to 1. He also had a passer rating of 95.9 in that stretch, which if that was his rating over the course of the entire 1990 season, and he played that way in the first quarter of the year, as he did in the second through fourth quarters, would have given him the fourth highest passer rating in football. He was actually pretty good. And he still finished ninth in passing touchdowns despite not throwing a touchdown over the entire first month of the season. So 1990 was definitely an individual success for Brister, even if it started out on incredibly rocky terms. But this whole situation was just bizarre, and highlighted the power struggle that Chuck Noll had with his players toward the end of his coaching career. Either do things my way, or get benched and suffer the consequences. Whether you side with Noel on this issue, or whether you side with Brister on this issue, is up to you. However, one thing is incredibly clear. We've never seen anyone back down from a comment faster and more aggressively than when Bubby Brister took back everything he said after Chuck Noel basically threatened his employment. So I guess the moral of the story here 
is don't make words that you're afraid to stand by. Because let's just say that even though Brister suffered a pretty big on-field loss in week one of the 1990 season, after these comments off the field, he suffered an even worse loss. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.